Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, once again to the July Lunch and Learn from the Harmon Museum and the Warren County Historical Society. Um, how many have ever heard of Victoria Claflin Woodhall before? Oh, we're talking maybe less than a fourth of you. That's a lot, though. That's a lot for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. First, I'll tell about our speaker. Uh, Judith Blackmore Dan is a professor of ancient history and lead instructor in the Classics of Humanities Department of Columbus State College. She has her BA, AB rather, from in the Classics from Miami University, uh, which by the way was also the Miami University at one time. Uh, <laughs> and she has her master's and PhD <laughs> in ancient history from the Ohio State University. Uh, her area of specialties include comparative religion, mythology, ancient art, and archaeology. She has been talking about Victoria Woodhull for about 20 years now. Uh, she lives in the same town Victoria was born in, Homer, Ohio. A small town, oh, about uh, 15 miles or so uh, north of uh, Granville, Ohio. Uh, she lives there with her husband and three children. Um, she is on the board uh, member of the Homer Village Public Library, as well as the Robbins Hunter Museum. Uh, the Hunter Muse Robbins Hunter Museum has the United States' first memorial to Victoria Claflin in the United States, a clock tower. And I'm sure Judith will tell you more about that in a little bit. Victoria Claflin uh, Woodhall is a fascinating individual. I used to tell my seventh graders about her when I was doing the Ohio one of the day. I used to pull out one. Uh, Judith has brought a number of books, some of them which appreciate Victoria and some which attack Victoria. And that sort of brings us to the title, uh, Queen Victoria or Mrs. Satan. The, um, uh, her somewhat sordid beginning was that of a clairvoyant. And I recently came across that as a youngster, she was here in Lebanon. On May 12, 1859, the Western Star wrote, one of the most remarkable children of the age is now in the Lebanon house. That's what the Golden Lamb used to be called. Astounding the people with her relevations through the power of clairvoyance. Miss Claflin is but a 13 years of age, yet possessed of this wonderful gift to such an extent that with her rapidity reads the past and astonishes visitors by her, the faculty with which she answers in, in ter, I can't pronounce that word, interrogatories. Um, her stay will be limited in Lebanon, therefore all who desire to test her abilities should do so immediately. <laughs> well, she went from being a uh, clairvoyant uh, to one of the biggest proponents of women's rights and the women's vote uh, in two different continents. Uh, fascinating story, and I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear Dr. Judith Dan tell us about Victoria Claflin Woodhall. Nope. Okay, is this on? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I'm so surprised. That was a lot of people that have heard about her. And I have to say, yay, we're getting the word out. Um, because most people don't even know that she existed. Um, and those that do know she existed usually think she was a prostitute. And her, um, her reputation precedes her in a not so glorious way. So I have spent decades trying to understand this woman and, um, and to right the wrongs of history. And so that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get the most updated information about Victoria Claflin Woodhall and her family and her sister. Um, and hopefully you will come away with a better understanding about her. I also have to say very quickly with that in mind, um, I met, I, I was just telling him that I am very, very, very distantly related to her. I have found out in my research and I am running with that and I am loving that. 
I, I can't, it's like that one little piece, you know, I've got to prove, but I'm going to do it. So um, I'll just call her my great aunt. But I did meet a, a, a much closer relative. I met a man by the name of Scott Claflin, who is her great nephew. And he actually is the one that put up the money for our historical marker in Homer. And meeting him, he was the most amazing man I have ever met. And he um, told me a story that in the early 1960s, when he was in elementary school, he told his um, teacher, he said, well, my great aunt ran for president of the United States in 1870. And she said, oh, Scotty, no, she did You know, <laughs> women didn't have the right to vote then, and there's no way, no one knew about her. And he said, well, yeah, I know she did. And he went home and told his dad, and like, this really is true, right? They sent him to nine counseling sessions with the psychologist. And he said he was diagnosed um, with uh, a lot of mental illnesses, one of which was creating fantastic uh, ancestry. Isn't that amazing? That just sends chills down my spine because you know what? Not only did this woman exist, we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of documenta documentary evidence that she did exist. And in my eyes is probably one of the most important historical figures in America, if not the world. So I think she is so important on so many levels. So um, here she is, Victoria. Now, first I gotta give you all her entire name. You ready for this? Victoria California Claflin Woodhall Blood Martin. That's her name, but most people just know her by uh, Victoria Woodhall. So the next uh, slide. So I have, there, there it is. So I live in Homer, Ohio, and I've got a little map. It's, it's way up, we're about 45 minutes northeast of um, Columbus. And I moved there 21 years ago, and I, we saw this, and my beloved father said, you know, that's where Victoria Woodhull was born. And I said, who? And I thought, what is this? Okay, I'm an ancient historian, so I get that. But, you know, I'm also a woman's historian. How could I not know her? So that's when I started on this, um, this trail to figure out who she is. And what's more important, why we don't know about her. It's more about historiography and how these stories get either passed down, changed, or squashed, which is fake news, and that's the problem with today, isn't it? So, okay, that is, and of course, Scott Claflin, see, there's his name, bless little man. Okay, so the next slide. So there it is, so when you talk about Victoria, you can't get away from talking about her sister also. Tennessee uh, Celeste Claflin. And as you were reading that thing, I'm just wondering if that was Tennessee. I think that was Tennessee because she was also a clairvoyant. They both were mediums, which is one of the fascinating parts about her, but she was a lot younger than, than Victoria and was taken around and advertised as come see the clairvoyant. They called her um, the Cincinnati clairvoyant, she was down in the Cincinnati area for a number of years, just as a little child. And if for a dollar a reading, she would channel for you. Um, and the poor thing worked probably 14 hours a day to feed her family. Uh, but Tenny, well, Tenny is completely written out of history and she really needs to come back. So the next slide. I've been doing research on Victoria and as you will see, um, the biographies are some good, some horrible, so many inaccuracies. So my colleague and I have put them all aside, and as historians, we are going back to the primary sources. So I have gone to all of Victoria's archives, and I've been looking through, sifting through all of this, and I found in one a um, scrapbook that her daughter made for her mother, and she wrote that in the front of the book. A brave sower of seeds, Zula Woodhull is her name. And that struck me because, it, that's what she did. She was one of the first people to plant those seeds of the idea where we all are now, that women have the right to vote, that women are running for president. It's really a powerful thing. So the next slide, and again, here's Tennessee Celeste. She was uh, much younger than Victoria. Victoria was born in Homer. Um, in 1838, September 23rd of 1838, 
Tennessee was born in 1845 in Homer. They all lived there. Um, and Tennessee was known as, they were both known as beautiful women. Uh, and one of the books, <laughs> uh, one of the biographies, uh, one of the sources says about Victoria, even at 54, she was a beautiful woman. <laughs> I take offense to that because I'm over 54. It's like, what that gum it? What does that have to do with anything? So they both were beautiful, but Tenny was the voluptuous one. Tenny was the sensual one. Victoria was rather um, nervous and serious and kind of more the brains behind the outfit. Okay, the next slide. So this is where, there, um, where Homer is. It literally is a crossroad. You blink and you've gone out of it. Um, I know exactly where their house stood. They have a reputation of being a rather poor family, but this was on the frontier in 1838. You know, the roads were, were dirt and the pigs and the chickens were out. Um, it was a tough time and everybody had a hard time there. Uh, this is probably the youngest picture I've ever found of Victoria. And right there, it doesn't look like much, but that's a Native American burial mound. And it's right behind the Homer Library. Um, and supposedly, it is upon that mound that Victoria used to stand as a child, and she would preach to the kids of the town of Homer. And she'd tell them biblical stories. But because she was a public speaker par excellence, she would sense when the kids were getting a little antsy, so then she'd switch it up and tell Native American stories. So it was just great, and it still is there. Nobody gets on it, so now it's very overgrown, but it's rather sacred to all of us at Homer. Okay, so uh, the next slide. So the family lived there, uh, and they, as I said, they were clairvoyants, um, and they sold snake oil. They had a number of concoctions that that Victoria's father, Buck, uh, contrived, and even Victoria's husband did it. So, but that's just what they did. I mean, you know, there weren't, doctors didn't have to go to medical school. Uh, so you had the doctors from medical school, and then you had people like the Claflins, who were magnetic healers. And they did that for years, literally for years. Um, they lived in Homer until the early 1850s. And there's a story that goes around that said that Buck, her dad, was a one-eyed, one-man crime spree. I, am, I don't quite understand where that comes from because we have scoured all of the court records and he was fine. I mean, everybody was suing each other for every, anything. The worst thing that he was charged with was stealing a $5 saddle and he was acquitted from it. So, you know, no big deal, no harm, no foul. Uh, but the story is that they got run out of town, that Buck burned down his mill to get the insurance money and took off leaving his entire family. And then the, this story, that the Homerites got together at the Methodist church and had a big hog roast to raise money for a cart to get the Claflins out of town. That is not true at all. I mean, that is such a fabrication because when we know that they, find, they moved to Mount Gilead, Ohio, um, and we found the deeds, that mill was sitting pretty <laughs> when they left Homer. So see how this, it's just, revisionist history. So anyway, the next slide. Um, all the while, she, she did have a difficult childhood. She, they were poor, um, and she was dealing, uh, she lost two siblings, two sisters died in infancy, uh, and she claimed to be speaking with the angels and the spirits. She also says that in Homer, she met this man, but she didn't know who he was. Uh, this is Demosthenes. So this is, since I'm a classicist, this is the only way I can validate the fact that I can talk about Victoria, because I know about him. He's a classical Greek philosopher, an orator um, from the fourth century BC, and she claimed that he was her spirit guide and that he came to her in Homer, so I love that. It's like he was in Homer. Um, she didn't find out who he was until she was in her th early 30s, and then she said, oh, she had a vision um, that, it, that she, she's gonna end up in New York, and uh, she ends up in New York and gets to a house that has a book open of the orations of Demosthenes, and I have a book over there of Demosthenes from the exact same time period, um, and that's why that is there. It's all in Greek, so. 
I, I can read it, but you guys can't. But just trust it's Demosthenes. So the next slide. So she definitely was a clairvoyant. Um, but because of her clairvoyance, this is where she understood the troubles that women were having, um, that you have uh, husbands that would drink away their the money and the children would be left hungry or they would be abused and women could not get out of these situations so she felt a, a great affinity to women and she too had a very difficult um, adulthood she leaves Homer and um, while a teenager she marries a man twice her age Canning Woodhull and this is the only picture of Canning I've ever found um, Canning claimed he was a doctor and they had two children. Um, however, Canning was an alcoholic and a drug abuser um, and he would habitually leave Victoria uh, for days and days at a time living in the houses of ill repute. And she, Victoria herself said, I aged 10 years in one night the first time he did that. And it was really horrible and it was a terrible relationship. So the next slide then, I think, there, there are her two children. So her first child, uh, Byron Woodhull, was born, and he was born mentally handicapped. We don't know what his problem, we don't know what the issue was. He obviously isn't Down syndrome, but um, he never spoke a day in his life. He didn't have teeth. He um, ended up being able to write his name when he was an adult in his 50s, because we have his passport. Um, but he was just this sweet angel that would walk around. Well, here's the thing that I am so impressed with Victoria. Yes, she ran for president. Uh, yes, she was a woman suffragist. Here's the clincher. She never institutionalized her son. This is a medical term that he was an idiot and she never institutionalized him. This, this boy was raised by family every day of his life. And I cannot, but to me, that's the greatest part about Victoria. The other part is that she wisely and very presciently understood that it was probably her husband's fault <laughs> that he was this way, <laughs> that his seed was damaged because of his drug use and his alcoholism. Hmm. In the 1850s? Really? Are you kidding me? So that's crazy. Then she had a daughter, Zula or Zulu. It, it, it is seen as both uh, Maud. Z well, obviously, he never married and had children. She never married and had children. So if you ever hear of somebody saying, I'm a direct descendant of Victoria Woodhull, absolutely 1,000% not. She did not have any descendants. But there they are. Uh, the next slide. So um, she had a very difficult life. The family went out to Saint San Francisco for a time um, just to try to make some money. She had this little tiny boy Byron with her. She had a drunk husband who wasn't doing anything, so Victoria had to make the money. Um, she was a cigar girl for a couple days. And then she claims in her um, self-autobiography that even her boss says, you're not cut out for this. This is too hard. This is too crass of a job. So she was a seamstress who then sewed costumes for one of the great actresses at the time. Um, and that got her on stage in San Francisco. We've never been able to pinpoint that. I've never been able to find documentation for that, but everybody says they were out there. Um, but. There's where maybe the prostitution comes in, because actors and actresses were seen as equal, and it was a seamy side of society. Uh, but she never did that, um, absolutely. And then she came back and divorced her husband. She's like, done with this. So she divorces her husband and meets this man in St. Louis, Colonel James Harvey Blood. He was a Union uh, Civil War hero and a fellow spiritualist who was living a double life in St. Louis. He was this very prominent man in society and ran a railroad, and then he had an office as a spiritualist, and it was right next door to Victoria. And they, they hooked up, uh, and they will eventually marry. Now, his problem is that he was injured. We have found his pension records, and he was very seriously wounded in the war by several different um, injuries one of which he caught a, a, a bullet in his left shoulder, which crushed 
this part of his shoulder, and a lot of times you can see one shoulder is atrophied, and it pressed on his heart. And so poor James couldn't do much without passing out. The other one was, the, uh, another injury was that he was on parade and his horse stumbled and he fell on the pommel of the horse and injured himself in those regions. And he had to catheterize himself um, to use the restroom. So what we have come to realize is Victoria and James Blood never consummated their relationship. So it was a very odd relationship between these two. They felt it was a spiritual one. Okay, so then these two will move the next slide. Sorry for all the gruesome details on that, but we're past that. Um, they end up in New York City in 1869, and they will end up meeting this guy, Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest men in the United States, who also was a spiritualist and used Victoria and Tenney as his personal mediums. Um, Victoria would read for him as his medium. Tenney would be his companion. Let's just say that. Tenney was, remember, the sensual one. Uh, we know that Cornelius actually asked her to marry him at one point, and she turned him down. The family was not for that, absolutely. Um, but what would happen is that Victoria would somehow read the spirits and tell him where to um, invest. And then he got a kickback on it. She got a kickback on it. And so we know through, it was also a time called Black Friday, kind of a stock market crash, um, they made, these women made, in a seven month period of time, they made $700,000, which in 1870 is equivalent to $13 million. So they go from being very poor, living in an area that's kind of the red light district in New York City, to owning a mansion in Murray Hill. They were one of the wealthiest um, women, probably in, in America, on their own. The next slide shows, this is Victoria, um, a very elaborate, and they, there she is with a painting. They had one of the greatest art collections also in New York City, and we have no idea what happened to it. Probably just all went away at an auction. There's no record of it, which is really, really sad. But what they use that money for then is um, kind of bringing themselves into the business world. So the next slide shows um, these two women became the first women stockbrokers in history in the United States. They had a stock brokerage firm that they opened in February of 1870. Um, it was on Broad Street, which is right next to Wall Street, so it was in the financial district. And they opened up this, this brokerage firm um, to earn money for themselves. Victoria said women need to be able to be financially independent. You cannot be tied to your husband. If you are abused by your husband because at the time the law of coverture said that once you're married you become one person, you can't sue yourself for abuse which is why women were in this situation. But so they're saying, no, women should be able to earn their own money, which allows them freedom. So this is a gentleman's magazine that covered this miraculous event. 2,000, maybe even 3,000 people crammed into the Wall Street area to see this crazy thing of two women that opened a brokerage firm. And you know what the papers talked about? Well, Victoria and Tenney came in matching taffeta dresses, and they were navy blue with this kind of hat. Yeah, is that a surprise? No. So the next slide shows the dress that she wore. Now, this is why I'm so amazed with what is in this museum. This is a reproduction. We don't have the dress, but this was in... Um, this is an exact reproduction. It's actually silk, wasn't taffeta. Um, of the dress that these two women wore when they opened up their stock brokerage firm. And this came from the American Museum of Finance in Manhattan. They had this big, huge exhibit of women um, on Wall Street. Well, then when the exhibit shut down, we got a hold of them, and it's now in Granville. So we got it. It's on this long-term loan, so we created a huge exhibit around the dress. So there they are. Um, the next slide. So, well, what do you think the papers also said about this? Well, 
Um, here it is. It says mesmerism in Wall Street. I don't know if you can see that very well, but that looks suspiciously like Cornelius Vanderbilt. And there's Victoria going, Ooh, because they were these woo-woo um, spiritualists. Well, obviously, no thinking man would work with a woman on a normal circumstance. So that was going around. So there's Tenny and there's Victoria. Here's another one, Tenny trying to gain clients, um, probably in untoward ways. Uh, the next slide. They were all over the newspapers and these political cartoons. This is one of my favorite one of them driving the bulls and the bears. And I just found this just this spring, um, a description of Victoria's home in England. She had and and in her office in New York, she had this cartoon framed in a gilded frame and she had it in her office. Isn't that hysterical? They said her, their office was just absolutely beautiful and of such exquisite taste. Uh, the next slide. So uh, a few months later in May, they opened up with all this money, they opened up their own publishing company. So they had the Woodhull and Claflin Weekly. It was a progressive newspaper. Look, progress, free thought, untrammeled lives. They talked about things like um, woman's suffrage, vegetarianism, shorts, skirts, good, God almighty, which meant to the ankle. Um, <laughs> You know, what are these women thinking? Um, sex education. Uh, so um, it was really quite an amazing newspaper. So the next, uh, here, this is just a front page, and that is Tenny holding the paper. Notice her hair. They cut their hair short. They had it shingled at this time. So again, oh, what is this world coming to? These women are doing this. Next slide. Um, so these two women then get in good with some pretty important people. Uh, they got in good with a man named Benjamin Butler, and he was able to get him in, get them into Congress. And the next slide, I think, there it is. Victoria will be the first woman to speak before a congressional committee about women's right to vote. So this was really amazing. And she wrote this memorial. She got in. Um, and we see Tenny is sitting right next to her. That's Victoria. Uh, and she went in and she said, and I'm going to show you something. She based her argument on the fact that women already have the right to vote. What are you people doing? She said, if you look at the Constitution, the 14th Amendment says every person born in the United States is a United States citizen. The 15th Amendment says every citizen in the United States has a right to vote. We already have the right to vote. You just need to recognize that. That was her argument. Oh, well, the congressman <laughs> talked about it, and the minority said Mrs. Woodhull's the best thing ever. So did all of the women suffragists. They thought, oh, yes. Um, and the majority report said, yeah, Mrs. Woodhull gave a really nice, very impassioned talk, but disregard it. Doesn't mean anything. It went away. Um, what I am uh, amazed by, this is the picture that was in a most recent American history textbook that was delivered to our office. This picture was in it, because I wanted to see, is Victoria finally getting her, her time in the spotlight? It was there. Oh my gosh, they have it. And you know what the caption was? A woman is speaking to Congress, but notice Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and um, yeah, look at that. And Susan B. Anthony are sitting behind her. Never mentioned her name. Are you kidding me? Well, the next slide. So she was very close to Stanton and Anthony, um, and they loved her because, and Tenny, because they had their own money. They didn't have to go to their husbands, so they could help this cause of woman's suffrage. The problem was, and they loved her for a number of years, um, but the problem was Victoria didn't want just the vote. She wanted equality. She was for the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1870s. She actually laid that seed for the ERA. Yes, we need the right to vote, but now we also need political representation, and yes, you need to vote, and yes, we need equality on all of these things. Unbelievable, unbelievable thought, and it was just too much for Stanton anyway, or no, for Anthony. Uh, Stanton will re remain her friend for years. Uh, the next slide. 
here they are. Oh, and then she became this huge um, public speaker, spoke to thousands of people at a time in places like Apollo Hall, Carnegie Hall in New York City and all around uh, the United States. And people paid to hear this woman. What? That's crazy. To roaring applause. So I was thinking, my, the first biography I read about her was very detailed, it was very chronological, very historical, not a story, but a history. And I thought, why is this woman forgotten? Why is she vilified so much when this is the response that she gave? She does become part of the National Woman Suffrage Association. That's this side, so we have Anthony and Stanton, and there's, uh, this is Isabella Beecher Hooker, um, there's Victoria, there's Tenney, uh, Lucretia Mott. These are big time people, Belva Lockwood. The American Woman's Suffrage Association was kind of a split off group and they had uh, a little bit of a problem with each other. Um, and therein lies the problem, I think. Um, because I want you to notice there's a man here, Tilton is on this side. That's Henry Ward Beecher over on the other side of the aisle. So I think that's part of the problem. Okay, next slide. Here in 1871, I actually own this newspaper, uh, Victoria tried to vote. And she goes in and they wrote an article about it in the paper. And she stepped up with four of her friends and tried to vote. And the guards are saying, oh, oh, oh ma'am, you can't vote. And she said, absolutely. She pulls out her pocket constitution <laughs> and schooled him on the constitution all the while that her friend snuck in her vote while she's talking to him oh the men were appalled so they went in there and they fished out her vote and they said look who she voted for see that's why women shouldn't vote that's what the article said okay next slide um, here they are with their shingled hair and the next slide oh I guess I should have gone ahead. Aren't these beautiful pictures of them? Next slide. I guess I keep going. Um, and the, oh, there's her signature. And the next slide is when, I guess we'll get to the, um, the way they were perceived in a second. Uh, this is probably my favorite picture of her with her shingled hair. So all through this, she's realizing that women need a voice and there's so many issues that she supports and that need changed. And so, she thought, I think I need a bigger platform than a newspaper, so I'll run for president. So, the next slide. She declares her candidacy um, for the 1872 election. She looked at um, the, I don't know which one she said first, but let's just say the Democrats. And she's like, you think you're helping us? No, you're not helping us at all. You Republicans? No. You're not helping us either. So she withdrew, went to a third party, the Equal Rights Party, who resoundly nominated her for the presidency. Um, she was running on ideas like women's suffrage, like infant care, prenatal care. And she said if, if women are to take care of their unborn children, they need to understand their bodies, which means sex education for women. Well, saying that was like saying she was, you know, a harlot. You don't use that word. Um, she advocated an eight-hour workday. She advocated um, a graduated income tax uh, um, scale. She advocated what will become the FDA. She advocated in 1871 an overriding body that looked out for um, pharmaceuticals and food for safety. She also advocated in 1871 what will become the United Nations. Are you kidding me? This woman is doing it and no one remembers her. So the next slide, who was, there it is, Victoria Woodhull, Presidentess. <laughs> Future Presidentess. I am not kidding you if the, if, you know, it needs to be used. I'm sorry. The, whoever becomes the next president as a woman needs to say Presidentess. That not, you, you can't get away. And I'll, I'll go to the White House myself and say this, <laughs> you gotta call yourself. Uh, the next slide, there is her running mate. Frederick Douglass. So they were trying to get the oppressed sex and the oppressed race. Um, unfortunately, Frederick Douglass did not recognize the candidacy. 
But he didn't deny it either. He said, I'm not going to run with you, but if you guys end up winning, I'll step in and be vice president. <laughs> he was supporting the next slide, who was her political opponent, President Ulysses S. Grant, who was an incumbent. And as some of the sources at the time say, even God couldn't have defeated Ulysses S. Grant at the time. This is what I have found in my research, is that, that um, Douglas and Grant were friends, and guess what? So was Victoria Woodhull. She was friends with President Ulysses Grant. His father used to write poetry to her and Tenny and her sister Utica. They knew each other. I found a document that said that uh, President Grant said, if Mrs. Woodhull comes to the executive mansion, she is not to wait and she is to be brought to me directly. So what I'm thinking is that they all knew what was going on. They all knew and they were supporting her. He wasn't afraid that she was going to win. Are you kidding me? She wasn't going to win, but she was laying the seeds. She said at one point, it, this is a lesson for mankind that women should be able to do this. That's what she was trying to do and she succeeded in it. So I kind of like him for that. The next slide. There is Jesse Root Grant, his father, who wrote the poetry. And we have his poetry as well. Next slide. And here they are. This is um, images of Victoria. So she becomes the first woman to run for president. Next slide. But let's not forget Tenney. Never forget Tenney. She ran for Congress in New York City in that same year. She, um, next slide, she, oh, there's a bunch of pictures. Aren't those wild hairdos? And <laughs> next slide, she dressed very masculine. Yeah, Judith, tell us about that picture right there. This one? Yes, they both were um, lambasted in the press for dressing very, in a tailored way. In a very tailored way, um, and, uh, and they always, usually dressed alike because that made more of an impact. So there really was quite a lot to the politics of dress of what they were doing, which is much the same today, you know, the power tie and the women's power slacks, and they were doing it back then. Um, so to make that mark, this shows, this is the man she was running against and she actually had to debate him and held her own. You go, Tenny. She also gave a speech to the German community in New York City in German and they resoundedly supported her. These are brilliant women, brilliant. Not formally educated either, self-educated. The next slide is, she also believed that women should serve in the military. And she was elected as colonel of an all-black National Guard regiment in New York City. So there is her group. She said, I am going, she says, I think you men are the greatest regiment in this country has ever seen and I'm going to deck you out. You need to look like it because the government wasn't giving them any, you know, uniforms. And so she was, she paid for it all herself. And she says, and then you're going to be the, the bodyguards of the first woman president of the United States. So they all thought, Ooh. and you get a free copy of um, Woodhall Claflin Weekly if you support me. Now, they didn't allow her to stay. Of course, the other men colonels stepped in, but the men elected her. So, uh, so what happened to this campaign? Victoria and Tenney spent election day in prison. So, what happened with this is that Victoria for years has been trying to, they, oh, here's the other thing that these two women um, laid the seeds for the idea of the Me Too movement or sex trafficking. And they were calling out guys. They had gone to an opera house and saw somebody they knew get these two young girls, 16 years old, drunk, and then took them back into a room, and these poor girls then became prostitutes. And they're like, uh-uh, no. And they called him out in their paper. His name was Luther Chalice, very upstanding man. And they were trying to call out all the guys who were using the prostitutes. So they also wanted legalized prostitution. Because they said, what's the, the women are the ones doing all the work. They get no help. You're, they're seen as scum. But yet, governors and judges and congressmen are using them. Uh-uh. We're going to start. And there was a whole movement of the women, the wives of these men. Oh, don't you do that because that's going to call out the men. And, and then they realized, oh, my God, my husband's name is on that list. Okay. You know, you can't do that, la, la, la. It was really, really a touchy situation. 
But in the same newspaper that they called out this guy for sex trafficking, they called out Henry Ward Beecher, who was a friend of theirs. And remember, he's on the opposite side of the uh, suffrage association. He was, as most people know, probably the greatest, uh, most prominent minister in New England. And he supported uh, Victoria in her idea of free love. The idea that a woman should be able to love who she wants as long as she wants. A woman should be able to get divorced if she's in a situation. It's not the Woodstocky, you know, in the streets. It's have, giving women that autonomy. And he agreed with that, but he wouldn't do it publicly. He also um, was quite a philanderer. And as Victoria said, he would minister to about 25 of his mistresses every Sunday. So he was quite a free lover, <laughs> but he wouldn't publicly support her. And she's like, you better do this. We need your voice. If you don't, I'm going to out you. And he didn't do it, so she outed him in the same newspaper. And she outed him. This is her friend Theodore Tilton, the other picture that I showed you. And that's his wife. They had a torrid affair together. And um, we know this because Elizabeth Tilton told Susan B. Anthony about it. Susan B. Anthony was in the home when Tilton found out his wife was having an affair with their minister, and it was a blow up. Susan B. Anthony was there. She was telling people, this is crazy. And Victoria's just the one that leaked it. So Victoria's the one that fell. She's the one that takes the blame. The next, um, it became a war. Uh, it became like an O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, everybody would go to this thing, and they had to shut her up because Victoria and Tenney were outing too many prominent men, and they had to shut them up. So what they did is they enlisted the aid of this man, Anthony Comstock, who was kind of a self-professed moralist, and this Comstock Act says you cannot disseminate pornography through the mail. Well, this story, this article ran in her newspaper. And he ordered a stack of newspapers to be delivered through the mail. He nabbed them, and they did it, and that's how they got nabbed. Federal authorities came and drove them off, and they spent months in Ludlow Street Jail. So that's where they were during election. Next slide. They were acquitted, by the way. So this is a slide I was thinking was coming. So, ah, uh, she's got these great lectures and everybody's, yay, cheering for her. And the next day in the newspaper, this is the stuff that would come out. Mrs. Satan. This is a political cartoon by a man named Thomas Nast, where we get the term nasty from. He did a lot of these kinds of political cartoons. And here is Victoria, which says, be uh, be saved by free love. She has horns on her head. She has bat wings. And she's looking at this poor woman who's trying to bring her children along with her drunken husband on her back. That's the problem with America. So this is the problem that um, you get this media frenzy uh, against Victoria. Next slide. Uh, and then this woman comes in. We know her, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the woman who started the Civil War, was sister to Henry Ward Beecher, was so furious that her beloved Henry was being dragged through the mud in his spotless reputation. She went on the war path against Victoria. And one of the things she did is she wrote a book called My Wife and I. And she modeled one of her characters on Victoria. And her name was Audacia Danger Eyes. So that wasn't good. Everybody knew what she was doing. The next slide. Um, so we didn't treat them very well in the United States. They left. 1877, they just took off. They were broke. Um, Victoria almost died of a heart condition. They were m just bankrupt in every way possible. And they left. And they went to England. And they would come back a few times, um, but that's it. Both women will die in England. Um, by this point, Victoria has divorced blood because it wasn't really a marriage and um and who knows who tenny married her husbands are always a mystery uh, and the next slide though is they both married very well so victoria married a man he was a huge prominent banker uh, john biddulph martin who became the love of her life she absolutely adored him so if you notice she was advocating free love but she was very monogamous 
It's just she had three husbands. <laughs> but there were reasons, you know. Oh, and she was also dragged through the mud because blood and Victoria took in Woodhull, who was so sick with his addiction, they had to take care of him. And the newspapers found out and said, wait a minute, you're living under the same roof with two husbands, you polygamist? And she said, it was the greatest thing I ever did in my life is to take care of another human being. So I just, I, you can tell I love Victoria. Okay, the next slide. Um, Tenny will marry even better. She became lady and she became, I don't know, um, Lady of Montserrat. They had the greatest art collection almost in the world. Uh, she had millions of dollars. And actually, Tenny is the one who will continue the suffrage fight. And in 1910, she came back to the United States and offered the suffrage associations a million dollars in their bid to gain suffrage. So it really was amazing. Both women will live to see the passage of the suffrage, uh, 19th Amendment. Next slide. Um, Victoria started another magazine when she was over there called The Humanitarian, not surprising. Victoria um, advocated school reform. She advocated the kindergarten method. Oh, she just was unbelievable. Advocated um, colleges for women, agricultural training for women, etc. The next slide. And this is what I love about your, the transportation room. She was enamored with cars when they first came out. And here she is. That's Victoria driving. There's Byron and there's Zula probably saying, Mom, slow down. She supposedly, now I can't, I can't prove this, but I'm going with this one too. She had definitely bought the first electric car in this area of England. And she was driving around and they say that one of these old stodgy British men was saying, I don't think it's appropriate for a woman to be driving a car. And they said that she just said, oh, but it will be. Yes, yes, isn't that the best thing? Next slide. Uh, she is in a sidecar of a motorcycle, for crying out loud. I love this woman. She loved uh, planes. She started a car club for women. She offered a reward for the first person to make a transatlantic flight. Uh, you know, this is way before Lindbergh. So uh, she just was such a forward thinker. She really was. Uh, the next slide. And she will die. She, uh, she, Tenny died in 1923. Victoria died in 1927. And the next slide. Here's, this is just um, older pictures of Tenny wearing kind of the suffragette um, veil. Next slide. So where the problems come. Here's where the problems come. The very first biography ever written about Victoria was by this guy, Theodore Tilton, right here. It was a biography that she, Victoria, um, dictated to him. And so she was a bit of a spin doctor. So she added a lot of gory details that may not have been kind of true. This was in kind of the most dramatic time of her life. The next biography came out in um, 1929, right after Victoria died, by a woman, Emily Sachs. And guess what it was called? The Terrible Siren. She, Emily Sachs, loved Victoria, thought she was an amazing woman, but she wanted to sell books, and so she made it lurid. Made it lurid. The family was furious. They were all trying to stop this book. Zula then, puts in her will, I'm going to pay for anybody who can vindicate my mother. I found the legal papers that said they found somebody to do it in the family, and he's like, I guess I'll do it. Everybody gave him the information, and then he died. I found the legal papers that said, well, that's too bad, but you know what? The quintessential biography's already been written. We don't need another one. All of the biographies on that table are based off of these. And so they're very incorrect. And that's why we've got to resurrect the truth. Um, so I just think these two women are, they started this trend that they need recognition for this. The humanistic trend, the trend of education and um, autonomy for women. Uh, the next slide. So the only memorials, there are no memorials to Tenney, none. I am trying to get a statue of the two sisters made. They need that. Um, they deserve that. But she doesn't have any. Victoria has two. 
memorials. This one is a memorial in England. It's a cenotaph. This is the Robbins Hunter Museum in Granville. And it's a uh, clock tower right there. And Robbins Hunter, the man who owned this building, he was redoing the tower in 1976 and he wanted to honor a local heroine. And well, Homer is just north of Granville and so he chose her. Thank goodness. And there is a Lindenwood statue of her that comes out on the hour every hour. And, and you notice it's like gilded V. Wood Hall. And we've got presidential march music that comes out. People come from all over the country to see this daggum clock. But here's the deal. If you do go up there, sometimes she gets finicky and she doesn't come out. Are you surprised? And one day I went to the um, board meeting and they said, yeah, well, Victoria never came back in last night. So we've got to do a little bit of restoration on her statue. <laughs> it's like, of course she did. She's not going to be held back to that hour on the hour. Uh, the next slide. So this is just what I think I found at John Stuart Mill, who is another great thinker. Um, uh, oh gosh, she, yeah, she just knew, oh my gosh, all the people she knew, it was unbelievable. She actually had a literary salon come to her house with, with presidents and, and CEOs of railroad companies and Belleville Lockwood and Stanton and uh, just unbelievable. She was a think tank in, in and of herself. But John Stuart Mill said, it had been said that you would never meet her and be the same afterwards. And that was me. I mean, I met her in Homer, and it has changed my life, really, because um, I learned so much from her, and she's so inspiring, just so inspiring. But what I always like to kind of leave people with is the next slide. Um, who is it that you've met that have never been the same afterwards? This is kind of the idea of history, and I love what he was doing of it. An Ohioan for the day, people don't remember this stuff. And then you only focus on those that, you know, that it kind of like gets trained. And we need to look at everybody here. So that's my, my thoughts of the, oh, I got to show you one more thing, one more thing. Okay, if you are interested in a book, that is good. This is the one you have to get. It's called The Scarlet Sisters. I'll leave it up here to look at by Myra McPherson. She's a Washington Post reporter and she now works very closely with us. She is absolutely fabulous. She's the first person to really bring Tenny out in the open. This one is the most recent and the best written. So I have to say that. The other thing is I just bought this from um, <laughs> I think it's the National Women's Museum and Smithsonian or something. It's a <laughs> puzzle about women in, you know, the suffrage movement and the equal rights movement. They're on it. I saw that tenny too. They're even on the back. I haven't even opened this. I'm too chicken too. I, this is just my pride and joy. So uh, finally, they're getting some mention. But also, if you come to Granville to the museum, there is the best little deli right next to us. Oh, it's so good. It's called Alfie's. And they kind of sell some, um, sometimes they have Victoria shirts. They don't have these anymore, but this cracks me a bit disrespectful. But can you see that? It, this is uh, Frederick Douglass, and, and Victoria's writing his back like um, <laughs> being carried by him. Isn't that the best shirt ever? So anyway, that's Victoria. <laughs> she actually ran for president technically two other times, but she wasn't even in the country when she did it, so it was just kind of a publicity <laughs> stunt. Um, I, I also have to read you, if you don't mind, really, really, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I found, again, at Homer Library, I found they did in 1984, six, something like that, they had a sesquicentennial for Victoria, and so they had this big deal. Well, some pastor, nobody even knows who it is, that, that gave this kind of eulogy to her, but listen to some of the things he says. He says, the houses of Homer lie silent and dark, the inhabitants behind the black windows dreaming of combines and votes and dwindling bank balances and new loves. It says, finally, you are being honored 150 years too late. Vicky, can you see us in front of the shining bronze letters thinking of the long, long forgotten righteous townsmen who scorned your presence? 
And he goes on, he said, Vicki, we are here. Are we the writers of the wrong? You who in your Homer days were scorned by the town, now we turn out to honor you. It says, your time has come, Vicky, your time has come. Your sisters and daughters walk not in your ankle length dresses to the voting booth. They walk out of law offices and doctor's quarters, fresh from Kmart <laughs> in designer slacks. There's the picture. They light up their Virginia slims. They've come a long way, baby, since you walked these streets and climbed the mound beside the church to laze away a July afternoon with Tennessee. And then finally, he just says, all is forgiven, Vicki, come home, come home from your foreign hillside. It's just, it gets, brings me to tears every time, but I get verklempt over Victoria. So thank you so much for letting me share her story. Well, thank you so thank very you. much, Judith. Folks. Feel free to come up and take a look at the display that uh, Judith has put out, the, the books and other things on Victoria uh, Claflin Woodhall. And also don't forget the gift shop, 10% discount. And please visit the museum. There's so many new exciting things going on. Hope to see you next month. Take care now.